I'm here with my friend Brody Hutchins at his house at an undisclosed location, and you'll see why it's undisclosed as we go through this wall of guitars. Uh, this is um, a big part, most of his collection, and we're just going to kind of go down the line and just kind of say something briefly about each one. So take it away, Brody. All right. Well, welcome to an undisclosed location. That's right. It's like the Batcave. That you could probably dissect this video and figure out the exact <laughs> coordinates of where you're standing. That's right. right. Um, yeah, it's well. Let me preface this thing before everyone gets all excited about. It. This is not like a legit collection. This is a guy who wanted to be a rock star when he grew up, but was never good enough or uh, risk tolerant enough to take a shot at it. So this is kind of a collection amassed of playing um, things I could afford and um, things that I wanted based on what I was inspired at the time. I just never did a good job of flushing the inventory. I just keep <laughs> stacking it all up. So you accidentally became a collector. Hoarder, probably. Is there's a line idea. somewhere in there. But there's a line. But um, yeah, the first couple, we'll just go down memory lane here. Um, the the first one, this is pr probably where it all really started. This is a microfret uh, signature, which is not real cool at all. Uh, you know, back in the, I think, 67 to 73 or something like that, they built you know, three or four thousand of them in Frederick, Maryland, and Mark Farner played them, and a couple other artists back then. But my grandmother, when I was born, a long time ago, uh, bought me a banjo, and my dad decided to trade it in on this electric guitar at the time. And I still have the case somewhere, but it's got these. I think they're the Armin pickups that are in them, but it's got a real unique uh, sound to it. And when I was a kid. You know, this sat in a case under my bed in the room, and I had to ask permission to get it out. So I couldn't get it out when my dad wasn't home. And, um, and I remember before I really started to play, I'd turn on the radio and just sort of strum along, pretend I was playing. But I would always flip it over this way because it looked more like a Stratocaster. <laughs> that way I always thought it looked goofy, like nobody's going to, there's nothing cool about this thing. It doesn't look like a Strat. It doesn't look like whatever. But, I, you know, I love to play it through... Uh, you know, a real clean amp. It's got a real just great, you know, sound of its own that I, I just love. But the memories are probably more important than anything else. A uh, couple of Les Paul Juniors, double cutaways because I wanted to be, you know, Don Barnes, one of several people I wanted to be growing up, of 38 Specials. So those double cut juniors and specials were always really great. A 75? It's a 5, yeah. It's a 5. 75 uh, Les Paul Deluxe, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about those. Yeah, probably that one, yeah. And then a, uh, a 1980 Heritage Series Les Paul. Uh, we'll talk about that one as well. Here's one that is one of the collector's choice uh, guitars that we're going to probably get into a little more detail as well. But, um, you know, the closest thing to a legit burst you're going to get is something like, like this. The weight, the look, the, the bangs, the bruises, and... And the pickups, they've just, they really nailed, you know, a, a, an authentic kind of underpowered PAF, which makes them so great. Um, another collector's choice run here. Um, I apologize for the string hanging out. I broke the first string in 20 years the other night, and before he filmed this, I didn't change it. So when we get into more detail, this will be trimmed. Um, <laughs> But a 335 is called the Pretty Woman Guitar, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what's become one of my favorite, favorite, favorite guitars, if I'd have had this from the beginning, I'd probably only play this. Who am I kidding? I'd, I'd still have a bunch of guitars, but I'd play this a lot more often. It's a, uh, it's an 05, 335 that I found, and uh, this is sort of my Eleanor to try to find because Gibsons are not known for you know, uh, naturally staying in tune. So for me, it was always a struggle to find one that stayed in tune, sounded great, but more importantly, had the right neck. I'm a, you know, I have girly hands, but when I'm playing a Gibson, I want that '50s ball bat. You know, I'm I don't like the I don't like the slim taper necks. Now my buddy Chris Delaporta, who is one of my heroes, prefers that one. So it just it's kind of funny, but um, a Lucille that just. BB King. I don't need to say anything else, but um, stumbled onto that one, and um, it's actually a, I, I use it a lot. It's got a great that little vario tone um, thing on it, like a 345, or a th it's it's basically a three. Um, 
it's basically a 355 without the F holes in it. With the ebony fretboard and the inlays and instead of the split diamond, uh, it's got Lucille in it. But it's really a great, great guitar. A little heavy, but it's, I love it. It, it stays in tune great, it sounds really good. Um, you know, and the other thing about these big guitars, they make you look thinner when you pull them. <laughs> Before but, you get into Strat World, you want to go down oh, this yeah. middle aisle here? Yeah, welcome to aisle two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, first, uh, a Paul Reed Smith. This is a technically a standard 22. Uh, so, you know, standard. There's not a lot of eye candy on it, but 22 frets and stop tailpiece. And... You know, I really never thought much about the. I was always, I'm, was, I still am kind of old school, but when these first started to come out, I was hearing some guys play them. You know, I saw Brian Forsyth from Kicks in advertisements and, and uh, Howard Lease and, of course, Carlos Santana. But during the 90s, when I met Pat, and, you know, I'm going to put on my hero list here in a little bit, um, you know, he was always the guy introducing me to new stuff. All I knew were Stratocasters, Telecasters, and, and Les Pauls. And, they all came into a Marshall, but <coughs> excuse me. There were there was a lot going on there with bands like Collective Soul and some of the artists that I had just mentioned. And uh, uh, who was the one girl singer that uh, from Ten Thousand Maniacs? What yeah. was her name? Mm -hmm. It'll come to me because uh, her, 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 her guitars played a PRS. And yeah, it and magical. And there was a there was a sound to it that it was like. What is that? And then when you heard a Paul Reed Smith, you're like, oh, it was, it's a Paul Reed Smith. So these were, were popular then, and there was a music store in Lancaster at the time called Stephen Nicholas Music. Um, that I, there was a guy that I knew there, uh, Mike Rose, and he said, hey, I've got this here. It's really cool. At the time, it was unique because the Dragon pickups really hadn't come out yet, except on that Santana model. And, you know, of course, I was you know, pretty young, 20, early, early 20s, and um, he's like, yeah, I got this here, it's really unique, it's one of a kind, and now that one of a kind means I know I need to clear my inventory, but his spin was, this is just the only one on the planet, blah, 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 so anyway, long story short, the Dragons, it was cool when they first came out, and it was a different animal, and I, and I played it for quite a while, probably, what, five, six years when we were playing, I, I, I used this one a lot. Because it's got the one the scale, it was real bendy, and it, this one's got the wide fat neck on it, which I like. It feels more like a Gibson, but I never have figured out that rotary switch. It's <laughs> too complex. So this gets played more by Pat when we get together than it than it does by me. But um, you know, it was a cool story because at at the time when I wanted it, I, you know, I had just gotten married and it came out, and I saw the Eagles, um, the Hell Freezes Over tour was out and Felder was playing one and I thought well that's one of those Paul Reed Smiths too so well if Don Felder's playing one that's then right between him and Pat everybody ought to have one then so my dad came to me I told him I said I really like to get this one and you know he he said look I'll I'll help you with it so he you know the first couple of he paid for it he goes how about you pay me a hundred bucks a month until you're paid off and he didn't make me pay every month so that that there's a special memory from him on that one. Um, another special memory guitar. Uh, this is a 52 reissue, born the same year as my 40th birthday. My my sister-in-law, my brother, um, bought me this. My brother always gave me a hard time, who's not a guitar player at all, um, but always gave me a hard time. Why don't you have a Blackguard Telly? So the fact that he could say a Blackguard Telly, I mean, he knew enough about them, but uh, just, why don't you, you know, you gotta get one, you gotta get one. And I never did. Um, so one night he calls me right around my 40th birthday and says, hey, come over to the house. And goes and laying on his dryer and washer and says, here, I got you something, you know. So that's pretty special that way. And uh, when these originally came, they were wired like the ones from the 50s, um, which I didn't know at the time. But when you went on to this pickup, a lot of guys would use that as a bass guitar. And that's why it, you know, most of the guys now in that middle position, you've got these two, and it sounds like a pickup. But it was, it would be crazy, crazy muddy. So there's a wiring, uh, wiring mod you can make to them to make them like the tellies that everybody knows today. And uh, so I did that straight away, 
and just you know tweaked it because he got it at a guitar center and I have yet to meet someone who walked out of a guitar center with a guitar and went, man, this thing plays itself, you know. So, um, but it, you know, I tweaked it and had a had a guy rewire it for me, and I use this one a lot. I really, really love it, and uh, and I've been able to play some real old tellies, and you know, again, not being a you know a real rock guy or a real guitar player, um, I just can't justify. That it, it's a whole lot more bang for the buck unless your ear is crazy discerning and even then it's probably still a better value. Um, 93, this telly, I didn't have one at the time. I was a sophomore, I think, in college and that same store, Stephen Nicholas Music, went in and I thought, I don't have a Telecaster, I want a Telecaster. I was playing with some guys in college and um, the one guy, Sean Goldthwaite, had one that was a blue color and I remember playing some Georgia satellites and we were doing some Neil Young with him and I thought you know I, I want to tell you I had, I had some strats and some Les Pauls but so I went in and there were two there that were just new American standards and there was this one and there was a uh, one that was like a yellow color and I played both of them for a couple of hours and just I couldn't decide and I thought this color was a little trendy and almost went with the yellow one but this one just felt better the more I played it. So I ended up buying this one and I'm glad I did because it's a Caribbean mist I think is the actual color of it. It's pretty rare. I mean there's some sea foams and other ones that are you know nearly the same but I think 93 and 94 were the only year they made that. And I'm still kind of on the hunt for a Strat from that year just to to match it. But it's this one's a little heavy but it, it's got a great telly sound to it. Um, and every time I take it somewhere they're like that's a cool color it sounds really good and it does um, what I don't like is on the tellies without the edge around this bridge I like to be able to like on here hold it up and there's nothing to really kind of hold on to so I wish that wasn't flat but so it doesn't get played a lot I've recorded a lot with it it's on everything that we probably recorded in that position because as Patrick would tell you every guitar on display should have the selector switch right in the middle. Um, don't start laughing kids. <laughs> this, especially you. Alright, this, um, you have to know my roots. And, uh, Which I you a, will in, a, in an interview, a sit down interview. <laughs> um, this guitar is special to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, and not just because the headstock's pointy or because it's got a, as Jeff Beck would call it, a wang ba. On it, but um, this obviously comes from that era of, of you know Eddie Van Halen and pointed headstocks, and when everybody's you know eruption and doing their thing, and um, you know PB, uh, I, I just I love that the stuff. And we'll get into some of the amps later on. But this guitar was in there was a picture in they had Monitor Magazine at the time, and it was their publication came out about every quarter, and there was a photo, uh, I was a big Mylon and Broken Heart fan back in the day. I was into a lot of Christian music when Christian music had some great rock bands in it, like Degar Key and Mylon and Broken Heart and White Heart. And this one, they had one magazine with Mylon on it, and that was actually even on one of his album covers, a yellow one. Funny story about that, too. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell it. You can edit this if you want. But the other day we were here with uh, another couple of friends of ours from out of town. And we were walking around Franklin. And uh, I see this kid wearing this shirt. It says, My Little Broken Heart, Big World. And it was a tour shirt from like 1990 or 89 or something like that. And I looked at him like, man, that's a cool shirt. And he goes, yeah, I got it from my dad. I was like, oh. So anyway. But on the cover of that is a yellow headstock of this. So very indicative of, of the time and the era. But so I wanted one because Mylon Lefevre played one and I, I just love Mylon. But even more so, there was a photo of Jeff Carlisi from 38 Special playing one just like this. And here's a picture of Jeff Carlisi of 38 Special has one and Mylon's got, I gotta have one. So I was kind of begging my dad hey can I get this can I get this can I? and and my dad was a softy I mean we, this was a special thing for us you know between playing music and riding motorcycles that was our thing you know and he was more like a big brother than a dad most of the time but uh, which made it cool um, so I was telling him showing his pictures and 
And you'd always get the smirk, like, well, let's, let's go get something to eat. You know, how, you know, you didn't move Chinese food? And I knew the Chinese place we went was close to Gardner's Music. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And I had no idea. And we get done, and he's like, is that where that guitar is you want to go look at? Yeah, yeah. He goes, well, I'm hungry. Let's go. So, anyways, um, I had the case, you know, put away, and I still, I break this out, and it is not going to win a beauty award. But one of the cool things about it that I'm, that is really practical, actually, um, each of these pickups has a toggle switch. And I forget exactly what it is, but basically it's off, single coil, or humbucker, and they're all independent of each other. So, like a telly, where you can have this pickup and this pickup on, you can do the same on this. And that was one of the things, kind of the one sound that I always missed from a Strat for me would be have, you know, have these two on at the same time. I, I think that's probably why this makes for a, a great recording rhythm sound. But here you can do that. You can turn on just this one. You know, obviously this, which is your Strat 4, or, you know, 5, 4, 3, you can do that, but you can do a telly too. So I thought it was really ingenious. If they could just put that in a little different looking package nowadays, that'd be great. Um, Sand the point down, maybe round it off a little bit. Yeah, and, you know, and hey, it's Ferrari-ish looking red, so that's cool too. Um, which way do you want to go? I go back to Strat World. I, Strat I cut World. you off at Strat World because right. for those of you who know what a Stratocaster is, you see there's a few of them to talk about. Right. Um, yeah. I love Strat. Um, I think early on, you know, and I, my, my parents had a great record collection and one was, um, you know, Slow Hand. And it's got the headstock of a Stratocaster on it, of course. You know, who's not influenced by Eric Clapton? to some extent whether they know it or not and some of us want to be Eric Clapton and uh, and play you know play like him get that feel with that you know whether it's cream or whether it's his solo career or whether it's um, uh, blind faith or whether it's Delaney Bonnie friend or Derek and the dominoes I mean it's just unbelievable but nevertheless I sort of you know in my um, whatever you want to call him years most active or most whatever, I threw myself into um, Stratocasters and specifically, you know, the Clapton ones because they had a little unique thing to them. Now, I don't enjoy these pickups like I used to, you know, back in the Journeyman days when that when that record came out. This was, um, I mean, now everybody and their cousins got a signature series guitar, but these were really one of the first ones. Obviously, the Les Paul was the first one, you know, but... These were pretty early on. In 1988, they came out, and in you know the August tour with Clapton in '86, '87, he was playing ones that looked like this, and people really didn't know what they were. And um, in '88, they came out production with they had a red one, a pewter one, and a seven up green one. And then in '89, they came out with a black one. And I was graduating high school, and of course, you know, what do you get a guy like me? You know, what would I most want? And it's it's guitars and my my grandmother um you know just love that lady miss her like crazy um wanted to know what i really really wanted for for graduation and i didn't know but she had talked with my dad about it and he said you know they came out with this line of eric clapton model strats and he would and i had another stratocaster at the time that i was playing and so when she came in for my graduation we made a trip to the music store and they arranged it and they got me this Stratocaster and I played it like crazy for a long long long, long time and uh, then I was a little afraid I was starting to you know wear the frets out too much and I never wanted this one to get to a point it's it's not like one of those killer sounding ones it's more special than it's a good sounding one but it's more special than it is good as far as a practical guitar so I, I didn't want to, you know, play it so much that I would ever need a refret on it. But a year ago, I took it to Joe Glazier's here in, in Nashville, and they they plucked it, and and it does. It sounds really great. It feels brand new again. But um, again, these lace sensors are they were great for the time, but they're they're really not stratty sounding when you when you really get down to it. So this is a I play it at home a lot, and I'll take it to church once in a while. And, uh, and play it, but it's not really my go-to Strat as a player really anymore. Um, this one is, because this this used to be 7-Up Green, 
and then we had an unfortunate uh, conflict between a tree and our band trailer and a couple guitars didn't fare very well so I have the body actually a friend of mine's trying to see what we can salvage with it but I put a got a gold body and put on that one for this and um, my grandfather actually routed it out for me in his machine shop um, but when that all happened, I just picked this up, this one up, which has become one of my favorite ones. It's it's heavy, which is kind of goofy, but these noiseless pickups, you know, and everybody who's swapped out anything for noiseless on eBay or Reverb calls it an upgrade. Um, I don't swap anything. The way it came is the way, the way the Almighty intended it, so I never change any of that kind of stuff. But I got this on eBay, and it showed up, and it just, it's, this one's a great one. Um feels good sounds good and when we go out and play this is the one the sound guy usually our sound guy always prefers and it's between that 35 335 or, or this one but and it's just a 90 something but uh, now we're getting sentimental on these when our kids were born you know I just thought it would be cool to uh, get them something from the year they were born I thought wow if I had a guitar from the year I was born or several it would be a lot of fun so when when my wife and I started to have kids I did that and I thought all right boys get blue and girls get pink I hope that's still politically correct now but um anyway our daughter was born in 2002 and the only you know decent pink Stratocaster you could get were the 60s reissue ones um, which are basically the same parts just assembled in Mexico and I haven't even taken the tag off the back of that one when I got it um, and you know for me the 60 strats um, I mean they're a little different animal but um, they sound great I've recorded with this one too this really has that sort of weak hollow sound I think a lot of the pickups are getting so hot anymore the guitars kind of lose their character but uh, anyway and a real flamey neck too I just I love it found it at the uh, uh, the same store that I got that that had changed names since then but so from 2002 my daughter Vivian has a Stratocaster and um, I bought this one this is an 03 I bought for my niece when she was born because they were readily available then and uh, the boys Alex our son was born in 2006 and uh, you can see where the stickers were on that pickguard, the way it's kind of faded. But I uh, found this one on the internet. Um, fortunately for him, this is like one of the coolest blue colors ever. You know, between, I don't, It's called Chrome Blue. The sticker's still on the back of that one. Because I got it used from someone on the internet. Um, but just a, a cool guitar. You know, I put Lay the Bridge flat, put a couple more springs in it. And this one's a 60th anniversary Fender from 06 and uh, yeah it's cool I don't know if he'll ever care probably sell it to <laughs> you know buy a switch or something I don't know but that one's that was cool and then um, when Max was born our third in 2010 the only blue fenders that were decent were from the custom shop so I'm like oh I'm gonna have to sell a kidney for this but um, so I ended, ended up finding um, originally did this. This is the Mercedes Blue uh, Custom Shop Clapton and it looks I mean unfortunately the custom shops feel like the old ones used to feel. I don't know why custom is now the new normal but um, Mercedes Blue and bought it and it's it's it doesn't get taken out or played very much and it sounds great I really really like it but found you know this guy on the internet that was an exporter uh, for Fender. He was a dealer or something and I told him, I said, you know, I'm commemorating the birth of our, our son Max, and it's, so it's a 2010, same year he was born, and uh, so we got that all done, and he goes, hey, by the way, I've got one of the the Daphne Blue custom shop strats. So a couple of years, they made the same the same thing in, a, in just a rare case, and, you know, the colored custom shop logo on there, but they made a pewter one, they made this one, and... I think since they've done that. So everyone's going to think he's my favorite because I bought two blue guitars from that year, but he, the guy gave me a screaming deal on it. and So anyway, I actually take this one out and play it. I don't know if I'm going to give that one to Max or not. Maybe that's just mine. 
You can have that one for his birthday. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's. Is there more? Because we'll, I think what we'll do, uh, because we're going to move on to acoustics, but I think we want to do that on another segment. So that was the majority of the electric collection. There's a few around that you didn't want to put on camera. I mean, he's he's got a double neck Dan Electro. He's got a, a, a baritone uh, Telecaster. Telecaster. A couple other random things around that maybe he didn't deem camera worthy, but nobody, not many people have a double neck. But we appreciate Brody sharing that. And now we're going to do a segment about the acoustics because there's almost as many as those. Do you want to hear the ba bases? Let's do the bases. Yes, you're bases. right. Let's cover all our bases. Because they're still electric. Let's we cover can edit all the that bases. other stuff out. Right. So we're moving so. on to the bases, which I'll let you tell them because yeah. they're yours. Um, I'd said on one of the other things we were talking about earlier that my dad and I had shared this um, affinity or affection of music and motorcycles and going to concerts and stuff. And uh, when I was in high school, you know, we had this idea: let's uh, let's start a band, let's play some songs that we all really liked. And we were playing a lot of the new. That you know, was mid '80s, you know, and late '80s, and a lot of the contemporary Christian music then was really like legit. There were a lot of those guys that are, you know, playing with a lot of big names over the last 30 or so years, you know, uh, Keith Urban and Garth Brooks and Little Big Town and, and so on. They came out of that, that genre, Dan Hoff and those guys. Um, but anyway, it was like, yeah, that sounds like a cool idea. So I was, you know, when I was the age of, I didn't want to be seen with my parents, I was hanging out with my dad. And, uh, one of the things he did is he went to a music store and he goes, well, I'll play bass. He goes, I don't have a bass right now, but I'll, I'll let's go get one. So we went in and this was hanging on the wall. It's a, uh, it's an 86 uh, made in Japan P bass. And he goes, well, that one will do, you know, and it had these flat wrap strings on. I say it had, it still has yes. the flat wrap strings, the same ones from when he bought it. And um, I've actually had this set up by Chris Delaporta you know, a couple of years ago, and I told him, and he had to take the neck off to do it. And I said, whatever you do, put those same strings back on it. And he looked at me like I had three heads at first. And then when I told him the story, he's like, oh, I get it. I, no problem. So they've been the same flat wrap strings on this. And it's a great feeling bass. Um, uh, I don't play it very much. It's just sort of here to remind me of that time, that era, and, and so on. But I've had other real bass players play it, and they're like, yeah, this is a nice one. Um, and then midnight, probably 95 to what, 97 or eight or so, Pat and I played in a band with my dad mm -hmm. and another really good friend of ours, um, Jerry Ryan, who played drums. And that was more about a hang than it was about playing music. But um, some of the stuff we were doing, you know, my dad was playing that and it just, you know, it's like, Dad, you gotta get something with some active pickups in it, which now I just sort of shake my head and go, how dumb were you? But he goes, okay, you know, so he went out and got this. It's a Jazz Deluxe five string, you know, with the lace sensors and switches and knobs and all that. But it just, it's uh, it's pretty cool. So I spent, you know, these are really reminding me about mm -hmm. the, when I played with my dad and with Pat and some other friends, you know, over the years. So they're here and I keep them up to speed and plug them in and play them once in a while. And when my bass player buddies come over, they can travel light and here you go. Those are great stories. Your dad was a great man. I enjoyed knowing him and playing with him. And we thank you for sharing many of those memories. And there's more. We could go on forever. That was, believe it or not, the abbreviated version. Um, but we, we do thank Brody for his time. And in another segment, we're going to go through the acoustic guitar collection. So with that, I'm PJ. On behalf of The Beard, who's at home, and I am enjoying my time here at this undisclosed location, reminding that no matter what you hear, you never have too much gear. Peace out from Undisclosed. <laughs>